Welcome to What? That old queen, a candid and adult take on queer life quandaries at a certain age. So please listen at your own discretion. Presented by Bernie and Tommy, their views are their own and in no way reflect those of any service you may hear this program on. Now, let your ears be upstanding for the <coughs> old queen. Tommy. Hey Bernie. <laughs> how are you doing? I'm all right, yeah. How are you? I'm all right. We just found out we're probably staying in lockdown a little bit longer in Bristol. Yes, I think London's the same, isn't it? I think Greater London's tier two, oh, is but it? central... Oh, I can't remember. I don't know. I mean, it's very nice to see you. Yes, it's nice to see you too. <laughs> I haven't seen. I haven't seen anyone barely. Uh, I, yeah, I know. Well, yeah, but you have been doing lots of Zoomy things, haven't you? I've been on Zoom constantly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and a few performances on Zoom. You you did one. You did a net curtain party thing, didn't you? Yeah, and a net curtain is actually um, being bought in for Zoom birthday parties. You you could be doing weddings. Funerals, bar mitzvahs. It's such a weird thing to come into a Zoom for 15 minutes to do a turn. You just sort of prepare yourself, get ready, and then do 15 minutes, and then you're back watching Antiques Roadshow. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't that just be your turn? But you're, it's just Annette watching Antiques Roadshow. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I would certainly make it my fee cheaper. <laughs> Oh, no, we don't want a cheaper fee, more expensive. <laughs> How's your week been? Um, well, last time we met, I was quite distraught, probably not in tip-top form, because sadly my pussycat was um, put to sleep. He passed away. He had diabetes. Yeah. Um, and I think we commented afterwards that it went quite quick, and then you said to me, oh, well, that's because you didn't tell a long anecdote which is apparently <laughs> what you should do um so i've got three for you okay and so you can choose one right and um, i've given them titles right okay so you can have pretty patel versus banana rama okay i'm liking the sound of that you can have firemen fraud and deep freezers <laughs> <laughs> okay. very intriguing um or city otters karen's and big withdrawals. <laughs> and big with the what? Big with the draws. Big withdrawals. Big big withdrawals. Yeah. I'm gonna go for the fireman and the chest freezer or whatever it is. Fireman fraud and freezers. Yes. <laughs> the three Fs. It is a it's sort of a sad story. Mm. I, I mean it did make me feel deeply sad, but we also saw the humour in it. So my parents are quite elderly and I spoke to them last night on the telephone right um and they just talk at me incessantly and I really only phone them to say I'm going to be on the news tonight <laughs> <laughs> and um, how long was that phone call it was about an hour <laughs> yeah. okay but they told me about their encounter with a fraudster which is just horrible really that there's people and I'm sure that they were picked on because they are um, elderly, like they must have data to yeah. hand these people. So they phoned up the, my parents and they say, oh, your computer's being hacked. Someone's watching pornography on your computer. And, you know, they get themselves, they get their knickers in a twist. They really don't know what they're doing. Um, they're trying to find the bank. But they ended up giving this fraud person their bank details. Oh, no. Um, and it, they've taken 400 quid, I think. I mean, they're... Okay. They're feeling pretty um, chilled about the whole thing, really. They, mm. they th I think they think it could have got worse. It could have been much worse. Yeah. Um, and there's still a chance that they might be able to get it back because it didn't actually go into the to the frauder's bank account right. by that point because okay. he kind of switched on. But it was a real turning point for me because I've I said to them, "Listen, if ever you're in doubt about the the people's kind of need." 
to get hold of you than just give them my number. Yeah. So it's about that feeling of sort of being the adult in that relationship. You suddenly have to yeah. take responsibility. Yeah, yeah, I've had all this with my mum mm. in recent years. And it's an odd feeling, isn't it, when suddenly you're the parent mm. to your were, parents. And they were really grateful for it, actually, that I was just like, you need to, yeah, you just need to let me sort that out for you. Yeah, yeah, totally. They weren't resistant to that then, because sometimes parents are. No, they were quite grateful, actually. That's good. Yeah. yeah. And they see me as a sort of technical whiz kid, which is, you know... if you, I always see you as a technical whiz <laughs> which kid. Which is, like, completely <laughs> what I'm not am. But, yeah, yeah. and um, so that's the fraud part. They were basically describing what a terrible week they've had. Right. And the, they've had fraud, but then... It sort of felt like it was even worse than this, was right. that they left the freezer door slightly ajar. <laughs> <laughs> and so a lot of the food had thawed out, so they were having to eat copious amounts of food <laughs> before it went out. The fraudster wasn't in the freezer. I don't know, they didn't specify. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what, uh, what they've been gorging on Arctic roll and fish fingers all week. It, well, it's probably more like lasagnas and, and sea bass, um, um, my parents. Okay. They're quite fancy with their foods. Yeah, okay. Yeah, mine would be Arctic Roll and Fish Fingers. <laughs> Which there's nothing to be sniffed about. Uh, uh, right. Oh. Didn't do me any harm. That's what I grew up on. Oh. Um, but, where's the fireman? The, what <laughs> we're waiting for is the fireman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they're actually busy watching Antiques Roadshow. Mm. Didn't notice. They live in sheltered accommodation, so a big block of old people's people in the in the block. Right. They didn't actually realise that the fire alarm was going off in the whole block um, until there was a knock at the door. <laughs> and no, they weren't watching. Uh, I tell a lie. They weren't actually watching Antiques Roadshow. They were watching Strictly. Okay. And they were watching a dance routine. And one of the contestants. I don't know if you're watching Strictly. I'm dipping into it. One of the contestants was doing a routine where he was dressed up as a fireman. Right. <laughs> and there was a knock at the door, and they opened the door. And there's like a troop of firemen <laughs> and they want to search the house because they think that they've that my mum has left the toaster on. <gasps> and had she? No. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knew what the hell it was. I think I might use that ploy. <laughs> I could do with being visited by a load of firemen. Well, I think you need to move into sheltered accommodation first. Well, I thought that was the plan for me and you. Uh, well, in, I'm ready. In a couple of years' time, I thought, you know, we're just going to take over that flat of your parents. My bags are packed. And we'll be looked after. You can actually move in there once you reach 50. So you're in there already if I'm, you want. I'm in the zone. Yeah. Um, but I've got uh, three more years to wait. It's so weird being 50 because suddenly all of those television ads are aimed at you like when you get the free parker pen or b moving into like a community and uh, and you're suddenly sitting there thinking oh maybe maybe that's what i should be doing and then i'm thinking no that's definitely not what i should be doing right now i don't think i, I don't think i'm an old 50 no but you should start saving up for your funeral <laughs> <laughs> which is one of the habits that but, i always tune into <laughs> well i've i've already got that covered mm. so <laughs> What else happened this week? Um, what city otters, Karens, and withdrawals? The, the, well, the, let's leave that for the for next time. <laughs> I'm so desperate to tell you that one, but we'll have to. I'll tell you. Later. Oh, go on then. Tell 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 city otters. So I was overdrawn in my normal bank account, so I had to go to my co-op, um, which I run a small business venture called Beacons, Icons and Icons, mm. who currently have quite a lot of money because we've been on hiatus for ages. Yeah. So I was just going to withdraw a small amount of money. Yeah. I know I've called it big withdrawals, but that was just the comedy <laughs> effect. <laughs> and switch it over to my current account. Yeah. And then they, at, the de at the desk, they said um, that I needed two signatures for this special account. And that's never happened to me before. Right. And so I kicked off a lot of fuss about it, wearing a mask, and they asked me to speak to someone else. Um, so they moved me to a desk where this woman, I can't remember what she was called, I think she was called Sue. Right. And I just went, look, Sue, you're not making it easy for me. <laughs> I'm trembling. <laughs> I, made it, I made a really big fuss. Yeah. I was telling my friend about it, and she said, you know what you are? You're a Karen. Have you seen these kind of videos that yes. are on, like... Yeah. Um, Karen's most 
Car- most Karen moments. <laughs> <laughs> this was one of my Karen moments. It was so big that there was a guy that was obviously the bank manager yeah. sat in the desk behind. Right. And I know him through Grinder, Of course. And his profile is City Otter. <laughs> <laughs> and so City Otto is sat at the desk behind. Right. And um, here's the kerfuffle that I'm causing. And this woman is saying to me, but what does your business actually do? And I said, well, we support um, LGBT people and we create like events for them. And City Otto just sort of pipes up from his desk and sort of comes towards us and says, Sue, do you know this gentleman? And Sue says, yes, I have seen him before because I was in there about a year ago kicking off because I thought I left a brooch in there. <laughs> <laughs> They've got you on a list, yeah, don't they? they have, yeah. <laughs> it's just a very knowing look. Um, and City Order just says, um, just let him, get, let just just give him the fucking money. He didn't say fucking, just give him the money. <laughs> just give him the money. <laughs> get rid of him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, so that was it, really. Oh, yeah. well. So God bless the city otter. Cheers to the city otters. I think he's listening. Oh, let's hope so. And from Do you know the, the city otters? I don't know them personally, no. But, but I, I'm aware of them. <laughs> 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 it's just such an incongruous thing, isn't it? Like, it's, I just want to go like, oh, you're a city otter. How's that working for you? Do you manage to get into any fresh water? <laughs> <laughs> You know, or is it oh. very, you know, living in a very urban life? It must be quite <laughs> challenging. Might be quite damning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, yeah, it's odd. It feels like they should be playing sports or something, as they're called, the city otters. Mm. But, yeah, anyway. I mean, I imagine they do play a lot of different kinds of things with balls. I'm, I'm sure they do. Plenty of ball games going down in mm. their house. <laughs> anyway, shall we go from there to Suzanne Barch? Is that oh, yeah. how you pronounce it? Yeah, I'm glad you said that because I wasn't quite sure actually. What is her heritage? Eastern European. Uh, I thought she was Swedish. Okay, yeah. Or Dutch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we watched the film Susan yeah. Barch on top. Yes. What did you make of it? I loved it. It was um, very... Um, well, it's produced by World of Wonder, who do Drag Race, don't they? And RuPaul was in it mm. as well. Like some really old footage of him, as well as him being at a recent kind of event of hers. Where he said um, to her, she said, are you coming to the after party? He says, no, darling, I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> and she's probably 90, isn't she? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I actually really like the way that she looks, because she's not do. You know, you can see her face is old. She's yeah. had a little eye lift. Yeah. And her breasts look brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she kind of looks like a beautiful old woman for me. Yeah, and I like that. Mm. I I like it when... I, I don't care if people have work done or not, mm. um, but I quite like it if it's left a little bit real. Mm. Uh, and I think if you're in the public eye, you should do that, in a way. Well, like, you can do what you want, really. Yeah. But she looked great. Well, and that, as long as they get permission from me, obviously, beforehand. What they have to say, Bernie, can I get my eyelids done? Yeah, basically. <laughs> I want my eyelids done. Uh, you, you may have that done. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of the film? I mean, it just felt really sad in a way that we were, like, because I suddenly felt like I really wanted to get really dressed up and just do an extravagant kind of... Because sometimes people ask me to perform on a stage when they're just DJing in the club. And I actually really love that. Yeah, because she started off in the clubs and wearing lots of fabulous outfits. And then she was a, a designer as well. Uh, I mean, she, right? d- she discovered um, Mark Jacobs. Right. She discovered Report, I think. Yeah, and that uh, that's kind of, I kind of feel the same way, that it, it feels really sad when we're uh, watching these things and you're seeing all of these big events and it just uh, you, you feel such a loss of that at the moment because of covid and everything it's just like ugh, i really want to be doing that mm. and it feels like the potential of that has all gone for the foreseeable future mm. which is also very sad but it w- the movie itself was a fabulous kind of celebration of her i quite liked her relationship with her son mm. i mean well. it's, it felt a very typical relationship in the sense that if you're like a completely extravagant creative character, then you're going to produce a child that will react against that. 
Yeah, I mean, he didn't seem to react against it. He just seemed to be really accepting of the whole mm. thing and really, like, he didn't, uh, like, he wasn't blaming her for being out all the time or at clubs all the time. He was just like, this is who she is. This is what she does. Yeah, but she, I mean, she, he was very, he was just very conventional in, in, in his self presentation. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he wasn't, yeah, fabulous like she was. <laughs> and I just loved her cute ex husband. He was just oh, gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah, quite camp, I thought. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Ben, no, eh? I don't. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. But there were lots of kind of uh, quite like effeminate straight guys there who were, I mean, there was one of them that was saying, oh, I, everybody thinks I'm gay and I'm not gay. I'm married. And, yeah. and I quite like that. It's just like, but you, you know, you get labeled because you're a certain way, don't you? Yeah. I mean, it was just a it was just a mashup of people that were really wanted to be very expressive and felt quite celebratory in that way. So yeah. let's hope that we can go back to that. I hope so. I quite like to be a bit more expressive at a club night sometime <laughs> soon, um, Mr. Johnson. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but she also did like loads of AIDS benefits um, mm. at the time. And I, fa I think was her exhibition in New York was uh, one of those was all of the proceeds of that were. Um, yeah, I mean, she was a massive advocate for um, HIV and AIDS. Yeah. And um, so she organized this massive ball and everyone who was anyone just bought like a table. For, you know, it's full of celebrities. They paid so much money for those tables. Yeah. And collected so much money for those charities. It's amazing, isn't it? And and it, because w where some of the footage was from in the timeline, it showed where we've kind of come from in such a you know, relatively short space of time in terms of AIDS. And it is World AIDS Day this month, and there's like very few celebrations going on because of COVID, which is a shame. But it's still something that we ought to think about and remember and, um, and remember all of those people that have passed, really. Mm. And I think that's something that you actually you don't necessarily need a big celebration or a big event to mark. You just can mark it in your head, you know. Yeah. Our friend Jeremy always says, he said something quite poignant to me once. He said there was a lost generation of older gay men because of mm. HIV and AIDS. And I feel quite privileged that we've lived kind of th through that. And we're the new older generation of gay men that hasn't been wiped out by it. Do you know what I mean? It's, it feels um, quite a privilege um, to be there. I don't really know what I'm saying with that. but <laughs> No, it's good that you're marking. You yeah, know, you, I think you it's... You know that you're... And it's yeah. one of the reasons why we do this podcast is to show that um, we're still here, we're still queer, we're just old. Um, do you feel older? Uh, like, do you, do you feel this year has aged you? Yes, mm. I do. I keep forgetting stuff because nothing really happens to mark the different days. So mm. I keep, like, my memory seems to be, and I, it's not just me. I've spoken to a lot of people and they seem to have that where things are just going out of their heads because it's just, like, not a normal life that we're leading at the moment. But we'll get through it, hopefully, and we can have a party soon. I was interested by an article this week in The Guardian, which was talking about Chopin and how his interest in men was airbrushed from history. Yeah, I didn't know that. I can't repeat how you said that. Chopin. <laughs> Chopin. Chopin, yeah. It's probably, he was called Chopin. Uh, yeah, maybe. I don't know. I'm I'm pronounce it as if it's French, but it's it's not really. It's Polish. But he's a national hero in Poland. But the article claims that archivists and biographers have turned a blind eye to the composer's um, homoerotic letters in order to make the Polish national icon conform to Polish conservative norms and were deliberately mistranslated and his interest in, in cottaging simply ignored. So, <laughs> I mean, we can brush over the cottaging bit. But basically, it's about how they've kind of whitewashed the fact that he liked men. Mm. Music journalist Morowitz Weber, who has been researching the composer in spring this year, so all through lockdown, claims he discovered a flood of declarations of love aimed at men. Some had an erotic tone and others were playful. 
uh, letters to one male friend opened with my dearest life and ended with give me a kiss my dearest lover I think that was to himself <laughs> gives a kiss <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's quite poignant because Poland has a pretty bad reputation at the moment in terms of LGBTQ rights. They've got uh, like LGBTQ free zones and things mm. like that. Their president, Andrzej, I don't even care how I'm, if I'm pronouncing this wrong, Duda, no, Duda. <laughs> we don't care about you. <laughs> has denounced the LGBT rights movement as an ideology worse than communism. I mean... What a terrible man. Uh, but I mean, hopefully, with the toppling of Trump, these other people will be toppled soon as well, and we can all get on with each other. It'd be change. interesting to see how that, you know, if if that change is is a global change. Yeah, let's hope so. But while we're thinking of that, are you hungry? Yes. <laughs> because I been rushed off my feet but I did run into Sainsbury's to pick up something and I managed to find a meal deal with the spaghetti bolognese but it wasn't enough no well as we're we've locked up the cabinet of curiosities for a while it's the return of snack out of it <laughs> and would you like to know what I've got for you yes so? because um I I haven't got an advent calendar this year right so every morning I walk into the kitchen mm. and I just open a cupboard door and I just eat what is behind each door. <laughs> uh, no matter who it is. <laughs> Even the front door. <laughs> Sometimes it's just a bottle of bleach. <laughs> Good for COVID, apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, um, I thought we'd start where we'd left off because I think the last time we did a snack out of it, we had pork scratchings. I love pork scratchings. So I'm, there is a vegetarian option, um, but I brought some pork scratchings from the Snaffling Pig Co. I think they might be the ones which we had last time. I don't think they are, actually. I think the other one was... Um, uh, can you hear that on the radio? Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> they do this on um, Mark and Lard on the Six Music. Chris is on the radio. <laughs> I know, well, I think they did that after we did Schnack out of it. Did they? I think they might be copying us. Um, so we've got pork crackling. I've got low and slow barbecue. And I've got perfectly salted. And it says, let's make the pig in ma magic happen. Oh, God, so filthy. <laughs> so, yeah, Snaffling Pig, we think if something's worth doing, it's worth doing pigging right. That's why we always set out to make the finest, most awesome flavoured pork crackling possible. The results of our endeavours are in your hands right now. Deliciously double-cooked nuggets with a lovely crunch that avoids the traditional style hardness. We reckon they're a thing of beauty. So grab a drink and get Snaffling. What do you think? Not bad. Mm, all right. I, do you want to try one of those? I quite like a pork scratching when it's kind of like a, almost hairy. I know what you mean. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. What's the? I know you don't like barbecue, but they're not very barbecuey, are they? No, they're not. Mm. But I do prefer just the. Perfectly salted. Mm. Well, I think they're good. I'm glad um, that you know that. I know. I'm glad that you know that I don't like barbecue. I've given you barbecue stuff before, mm. and you've gone. I don't like it. But I do like a barbecue. And yeah, I know. I know that. <laughs> so our. <laughs> it seems like you know everything about me. <laughs> well, we've been doing this podcast for over a year. I think I've got a little window into your mind and your life. Um, so for our vegetarian option for our veggie and vegan friends, um, we have King's Black Bean Sauce Flavoured Veggie Jerky. Plant-based meat-free jerky. High in protein. Vegan-friendly snacking. So let's... Now we've had the dirty pig, let's have some clean 
And is it healthy as well? Uh, yes, it's high in protein, so I imagine it's... Oh. It's not exactly quite rubbery, it's not. Mm, it's kind of brown and rubbery. It's not a, an awful taste. Are you watching I'm a Celebrity? No, I haven't seen any of it yet. There's what? a lot of eating of different objects and things and creatures. Right. I'm not sure how I feel about the treatment of animals and their... Mm. Um, what do you call it? Things that come out of them as kind of just purely entertainment. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think this is a bit more highbrow, what we're doing. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't hate these. But I prefer the pork scratchings. I, like you, prefer the pork scratchings. But if, if I was desperate, I'd happily eat plant-based meat-free jerky. Um... I just wish it. I guess we've we've done the wrong thing because we've gone from something which is quite crunchy to something quite mm. chewy. It's like if you have um, a dessert and then you go into full-bodied wine. Mm. Anyway, well, we can snack on those through the break while we wait for our guests to arrive. Who is? Da, 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 da. Can we do it in a French accent? Yeah. I don't know why I feel like it, but I just want to do a Jean Bannon. Jean Bannon. <laughs> <laughs> what does Bannon mean? Um, I don't know. We'll have to ask her when she comes on. Which well, she uh, might not know. But she'll be joining us in the throne room, and she's an artist working in performance, choreography, and live art. So we can ask her all about that and her shows and what she's done during lockdown because she's got an interesting project that she's done during lockdown which I discovered today so yeah. can you hear more? yeah alright so we'll, we'll wait for her to come into the throne room and we'll uh, carry on with the crackling um, we'll be back after this if you're enjoying What That Old Queen please share our episodes on social media and subscribe on whatever podcast platform you listen on. If you can write a review, that would also help expand our audience too. We don't have any advertising or sponsorship, so if you can contribute to our Patreon account or help us by buying some merch, the links are in the episode description below or on our website, thatoldqueen.com. Thank you for your continued support. Okay. So we're back, and we have a fabulous guest. We have Madame Jo Bannon. I was just wanting to say your voice in a French accent. Oh, go on then. Well, Jo Bannon. <laughs> <laughs> Bannon? Uh, oui, Bannon. <laughs> Is it French? No, it's proper Irish. Oh, Bannon. yes, I think, uh, yes, I remember. But, you know, they have, they've got links with the French, right? Brittany. I mean, who hasn't? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you doing? What what some of you, the people that know your work don't realise is that you're a massive fan of this podcast, bizarrely. <laughs> I am like a mega fan. And actually, I was a little bit bitchy about uh, some of my pals who were on the Christmas special. Right. And uh, I was just raging jealousy <laughs> so I'm I'm absolutely delighted and feeling a bit smug to have my very own episode well of course why would you not have your own episode <laughs> the best things Quite come right. to those who wait <laughs> yeah totally exactly so. <laughs> uh, and if we're ever in a position where we can have like a Christmas party episode again you're you're invited oh imagine Imagine going to a party. Uh, yeah, I mean, one one of my ambitions is to do this show live with a with a party in mm. a club after or something like that. But yeah, that's obviously post COVID. Yeah, I know, Tommy. You've been doing lots of Zoom after parties. Does it measure up? Um, well, for me, I would say definitely no. I would say it's just better <laughs> than nothing. You seem, I yeah. don't feel snobbish about it. You know, a lot of people are saying I don't like I don't like performances on Zoom or I don't like 
online performances, I just feel like, you know, we've got to have something. Yeah. Zoom is slightly awkward. I mean, it's different in this kind of situation because it's a bit like having a phoning guest. But we've all had to come to grips with it, haven't we, during COVID times. And it's still a bit odd. And we've we've all realised why video calling didn't really take off beforehand. <laughs> it's true but i i think fundamentally it's a bit awkward and then i don't know about you but i've definitely been returning to a kind of teenage social awkward state because Mm. of the lack of regularity of social occasions or that you don't bump into people you have to arrange everything so I just feel like I'm being so awkward all of the time and then it's mitigated through zoom (laughs) that it's just a car crash (laughs) well I think (laughs) yeah everybody feels the same way I think I know I do uh Joe it's brilliant to have you on the show I've known your work as a performance artist, live artist for years now. And I don't know how long I've known you, but it felt like at the beginning of when we knew each other, you didn't put your voice within the work as much as you do now. Mm -hmm. Would you Mm -hmm. say that's true? Yeah, for sure. And recently we've been in a a publication. I can't remember the name of the title of the book. I've been trying to find it. I've been scouring my flat. I think it's uh, In Other Words or In Other Voices. In Other Words. In Other Words. In Other Words. Yeah. Yeah. And there's this most beguiling picture of you dressed as a saint. Um, (laughs) Yes. Saint Lucy. Tell us about Saint Lucy. So In Other Words was a publication put together by Kate Marsh, who is a choreographer and artist and kind of, disability advocate and she contacted a bunch of us I think quite near the beginning of lockdown 1.0 about contributing something to this book and it was quite an open invitation it wasn't explicitly about lockdown or about covid but at that time I was quite obsessed with do you remember that brief moment where everyone was doing reconstructions of films or images but in their domestic homes yes i did so a few a, myself oh did you tell me i didn't i didn't see yours i'm gonna google that later well go back on instagram and you'll find some <laughs> okay, okay. i even and did i even did anna winter working from home Oh, you're such a good Anna Wintour. Because of uh, course. The, the listeners cannot see, but Joe, the backdrop is a bu- uh, is a bookshelf, and that was. I know. And Anna Winter sort of was the one that really put that as a thing right at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> if only she'd had her wardrobe, that would have been much more fascinating. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And like um, Jess Phillips, who uh, or Phillips, the Labour uh, MP, who I saw her on the news quite near the beginning of all of this, and she was in the most messy living room I've ever seen, and the angle was basically under her chin, and her ceiling was a bit dirty, and I just thought, I secretly love you for the lack of <laughs> care that's, you've taken on this image. But that's what my parents do. They're just zooming in on, like, my mum's saggy breasts or, <laughs> like, my dad's crotch. That's, like, that's what they see. They, they, they can't seem to see it through. But we're they digressing. Their angles. <laughs> we're digressing. We want to know about the image. We're digressing, yeah. yes. Um, so I guess I was thinking about, I mean, I was quite resistant to making anything at that time because I felt like, let's chill out, guys. Let's just have a pause. But I was thinking about resilience. And I guess a lot of artists that I knew that identified as disabled were talking about feeling quite under siege. I mean, this was the time when there were conversations, which I think we've slightly forgotten, where there were conversations about who would get a ventilator and if the NHS got overwhelmed, what judgment we'd make on which lives were worth protecting. So I felt in quite a fuck you kind of mood. Yeah. And so in a sort of strange response to that, I made this recreation of a portrait of St. Lucy. So I grew up in kind of Irish Catholicism and I think that that religion's take on image making and what an image can do 
what kind of meaning it can have as really I mean, in some ways, I think it's why I make theatre or the kind of theatre I make. And St. Lucy is always pictured as if she's real, painted with either a plate with two eyes on it or with her hands in front of her with two eyes painted on the hands. And I was just really fascinated by this image of her. So St. Lucy, when you're um, growing up Catholic at about nine or ten, you do your confirmation, which is a a ritual where you get to choose a saint's name to to add to your own. And when I was nine or ten, I chose Saint Lucy based on the story that they tried to marry her off to some pagans or atheists or whatever, and she wasn't having any of it. And so they tried to burn her, and she just didn't burn. And then they tried to burn her again, and she just didn't burn. And they tried a third time and she still didn't burn. And so in the end, they just had to run her through with a sword. Knowing you, (laughs) it sounds a lot like you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, I think I think I probably did know myself at 10 a lot better than I thought I did. Yeah, exactly. So I, I sort of chose her as this kind of emblem. And so, yeah, I don't know quite why I chose that, but it felt sort of meaningful to recreate her so I worked with my partner who's a filmmaker and we took this image where I used do you remember those old 70s sundial clock mm. sort of teak I used one of those as my halo and I had an old scarf as a kind of shawl and I sort of recreated this and um, was that clock just hanging in the background what did you have it on your lounge anyway it was it does live in my lounge but we ended up rigging it on a kind of light stand so that it was perfectly hovering and then there's a tiny bit of photoshop but i feel like in the age of instagram we're all allowed a filter oh yeah to have to well all of the filters i'm allowed (laughs) (laughs) whatever gets you through yeah my hashtag is all the filters not no filter um (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so tell us about your process and 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 why you do your work because you meant you touched on that just a minute ago well I think like you say Tom it it changes and and my god you've had the longest career of all of us so you know about these kind of shifts of focus in a practice I think um when I started out I was really resistant to including my kind of autobiography or identity in my work because at the time, I felt like there was a slight fetishization of that kind of identity politics or a, a sort of currency in being different, which, of course, I really value the currency of being different, but I kind of always want it to be under my own terms. But anyway, I don't know, about eight years or so ago, I made a piece called Exposure, which was a performance for one audience member at a time that happens almost entirely in the dark. So you come into this small room and you sit down and you're in the dark and you listen to my voice talking about talking about how we see each other and whether the only way we see each other is through vision, through our eyes, or whether there are different ways of seeing each other. Um, and I guess that work was a lot informed by two things. One is growing up with albinism and so always feeling other or queer or hyper visible in a crowd or in a street and that coupled with having a visual impairment so feeling very looked at but not feeling like you could ever fully look back because my vision is kind of wonky and so I wanted to make this kind of space where we equalized that way of looking at each other And as a kid, I remember going for eye exams. And uh, I don't know what this says about my kind of repressed sexuality. (laughs) But I just remember them feeling like the most charged, intimate spaces that you'd go into. Yeah, it's like better or without. (laughs) Yeah. Here or here. Yeah. And that, you know, the, the person doing the examination is they're almost brushing your face with that torch or they're you so can hear, kind you of... can feel their breath on you yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and they are fundamentally okay through a medical lens but they are trying to look inside you or see you and um yeah i found that a very kind of charged potent kind of space 
so so I made that work and it kind of had this reaction from people who saw it and that work I kind of joke that it's the show that won't ever die because I think it's about 10 years actually I'm still touring and showing it and I saw that yeah. show quite early on in its in its uh, evolving and we had quite an intimate experience at the end I don't know if you remember this I do I think I do but you uh so there was a lot of about your childhood and there was images as I recall there were images of you as a child in in Mm. the show and then at the end you just leant over and we held hands and after the show I think we were in the bar or something you said I don't normally do that (laughs) (laughs) but I just felt compelled and I was really pleased that we had that moment because it was just lovely Um, And the second thing I wanted to say about it, which is just bringing it back to a really prosaic level, is like, I remember buying some lights lights for my bike. And I was asking the guy, like, which are the best lights to buy? And he said, well, that depends, of course. Do you want to be seen or do you want to see? (laughs) (laughs) Very profound. It was so profound, but also really prosaic. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, the the kind of huge rub is that often, if you want to see, you have to be seen. So if, you know, a, a big thing, I don't get it quite so much anymore, but a big thing I used to get was people asking to look in my eyes. So my eyes are a kind of purpley, pink, blue, grey, they kind of change in colour. And sometimes you just clock someone just looking at you in in just a slightly weird way. And... And this realisation that they were trying to look at your eyes. And so that's a kind of conundrum because, uh, like you can tell, I'm quite a, not confrontational, but I I, I try not to take any shit. (laughs) Do you have a strategy to to deal with that? Well, yeah, that's the difficult thing because my actual strategy would be to stare at them. But that's kind of giving them what they they want. want. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) So I end up, I've been watching The Crown lately and I realise, oh, I do a sort of weird lady die where, <laughs> where I kind of look down. But it's not, it's, not, it's not intended as submissive, but it's like you don't get to look at me in that way. But of course we can never control how, how we're looked at and the kind of interpretations that people make of us. Um, so yeah, often that choice about whether we want to see or be seen is it's both and it's both all the time yeah totally yeah. And it's also wondering what the motives are for people looking at you as well isn't it and and whether it's a positive motive or a negative one um yeah and then yeah. we have to rely on our own insight to work that out of course we haven't been seen very much by people uh this year <laughs> because of <laughs> lockdown <laughs> And true, so true. you've produced something during lockdown called Absent Tense. So tell us about that. Yeah. So um, having said I was kind of resistant to making anything during lockdown, I immediately uh, went against myself and did. Um, I made a piece called Absent Tense, which was a, I guess I would call it an audio essay, but you could call it a series of short podcasts. It's my voice and and it also exists as a, a text publication and I was invited by Home which are a venue in Manchester they had a series called Homemakers that was about work that you could make from home and of course me and Tommy live in the live world we live in theatres and rehearsal studios and so it was a kind of provocation about how you might make work now and at that time so lockdown was happening and my world as all our worlds were completely changing yeah, and I was constantly thinking about absence. And uh, there was a guy who was talking on Twitter. He was kind of talking about Zoom, actually, talking about how awkward Zoom is. And he said something about he could deal with the absence, but what he couldn't deal with was the presence of our absence. So something about... What does that mean? This, well, I took it to mean... And I sort of have this relationship with friends. If they go away for a year, I'd rather they just go... And when they come back, we'll have a big catch up over a bottle of wine. What I find more difficult are these kind of um, video calls or uh, it's almost like those phone calls remind me that you're not here. You're yeah. not present. <clears throat> totally. You, I'm dealing with 
the joy of seeing you, but also not really seeing you. Mm. And I feel like that's what we were all experiencing in the first lockdown. And that huge uncertainty about whether that would ever return. Mm. And then I guess the other huge thing I was dealing with was my dad was very, very sick. And we knew that he was dying and he has subsequently passed away. And he was having complications from his cancer treatment, which meant that his breath, his breathing was becoming really irregular. And he started doing this thing where he would effectively stop breathing for a few seconds and then sort of pass out and then quickly kind of come back. So he's having these kind of fainting fits or absences. Yeah, so I, I, I started thinking about what it is to reckon with absence like we were all doing while still being present, still living. So my dad was, in these moments, it felt like he was dying or dead, but then he'd come back and life was still carrying on, but we were at one remove. So I made, I basically wrote these 12 chapters or episodes about absence. So it touches on those kind of themes. Yeah, I guess I was interested in the the presence that absence can have. That absence isn't a negative void, a lack of something. It can feel really full, mm. almost too full as an experience. Having you here, mm. you know, you're just perched on Bernie's laptop on my dining table. I go from tricking myself to think that you're actually sat at that chair mm. you know it does feel like you're in the room but then I remind myself that you're not here that's what mm. I wanted to say in response to that but also I, I wondered if you caught the Split Bridges show that they premiered from New York last Friday called The Last Gasp oh which no is all I about, heard it was all yeah. about the last breath really because it, they were making this show anyway before covid um mm -hmm. because it was basically they thought that it might be peggy shaw's last show because she's getting really old now and she can't remember lines and you know she has some health problems um mm -hmm. but then suddenly everything seemed to be about breath you know, they were actually strangling people. The police were strangling people. Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, it was just like, it, it, it was everywhere, really. And that, I think, is something that happens when you make art, is you suddenly see these these connections that run through life. And it, mm. like, that's like, it sounds like what you're talking about, really. Yeah, and I think, I think it, you know, the kind of joy I find as an artist is a permission to think, laterally like horizontally about things rather than linear yeah so you can start thinking of subject and start sort of riffing about the the different things that that reminds you of and i yeah i often don't you find that that there's often a i don't like this term zeitgeist but but maybe a group of artists or writers or thinkers might have tuned in to a certain kind of rumbling that's already that's already going on because no one could predict COVID. But I think what we could predict is, is that this idea that health is distributed equally is false, that health is not implicitly tied to economy. I mean, we know that really now to be true. And we might be approaching the time when testing becomes, you know, you might need a test to get in or do certain things and you might have to pay for that. But the that your prospects of health are directly linked to wealth. And I think these things were true all along. The fragility. Yeah. It's all about equality all or equity. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, I'm sure they didn't know that COVID was going to happen, but Peggy has always been, or recently has been living in a state of precarity. And how different is that really to living with COVID? I mean, it's just precarity writ large. Mm. Yeah, it's it's exposed so many things, this pandemic, hasn't it? So many things, like the whitewash of our society in so many ways. Yeah, yeah. It's it's uncomfortable, isn't it? Um, yes, <laughs> in more ways than one. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I, I don't know, my experience of this pandemic has been sort of micro and macro. So on a macro level, like there were times when we were deciding with the paramedics in the living room that we weren't going to let dad go into hospital because 
he'd have to go on his own and he'd probably get COVID. And like I say, his breathing was already fucked. So, so there was kind of macro dilemmas and then there was micro dilemmas that felt equally traumatic. Like, I don't know, not knowing where you were going to get your shopping from or mm. yeah, that idea of uncomfortable, it's kind of uncomfortable on a global scale and also uncomfortable because you have to sit outside and get cold and yeah these things are kind of closer than we think in their experience a kind of big catastrophe is quite similar to a small catastrophe in a weird way yeah and then having all the catastrophe levels (laughs) just just makes you go a bit splat (laughs) (laughs) yeah for sure Um, i mean i i did really enjoy your podcast in those early weeks because um yeah it just felt so uh collegiate the word like friendly just two pals it felt like a time that might be over where you could just hang out yes yeah well i think it's it's really bizarre but thinking back to those shows because i think both you and i tommy were having quite a difficult time well i was outside of recording that weren't we my some of my friends never listen to the podcast. It's nice that you do, Joe. Um, <laughs> uh, and they just say, well, well why would I? Because I can access you whenever I want. But they, they started to listen to it during lockdown, which was quite nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then uh, just going back to what you that publication we were in, and in other words, they made an audio described version of the book that was released on the same day. And they invited the artists who wrote articles or did things for the book to read or describe what they'd submitted for the book. And then I can read text, so I read the book, but I went back and listened to the artists describing their entries because I just really wanted to hear my friends. (laughs) (laughs) And I remember you chatting on about your entry and... You know, just hearing people's voices felt really important. It was actually such a brilliant thing to do because I've never done an audio description of our work. And actually, the piece that I made was like, it was prolific in the sense of the work, how many words it was used. I could never use the words that were all described Mm -hmm. because it was like a periodic table of things that I've experienced during lockdown. There was a lot of words on that table. So I just, so I just chose a few choice words really that would try and capture the essence of the work really it was it was a big challenge to do that but it was really enjoyable yeah and I think it really I guess it leads back to something about how we understand or how we look you can read something but then a sort of tone of voice or a lingering on a certain word or phrase gives you a whole new meaning so actually when I read your page Tom I didn't read every single word because there were quite a lot But when I heard you describe it, I sort of understood it in a different way. Yeah, so often I think those adaptations for different access needs aren't translations. They're kind of, they add to the work. Mm. They give a different perspective. They definitely do for me, yeah. Because there is an inherent um, dryness and a sense of humour about my work that might not be captured when there's just words on a page. But it's definitely in your tone of voice, even just now. <laughs> <laughs> do we want to do something else now? Because we could talk for ages, Joe. Yeah, and we could it's talk. Quite, for ages. It's quite highbrow this conversation for us. Don't uh, you think, uh, for this for this podcast, yeah, definitely. I mean, is we, it too highbrow? I'm sorry. We is haven't mentioned high- dildos yet, so um, <laughs> can I? Um, can I say one thing? Can yes, I say one thing? Yes. My partner. So I had a sort of. A, mild panic because I was like oh but I am a white straight cis woman you know absolutely honorary member of the queer community of Bristol but still but I was thinking recently I'm at least I'm not as straight as my partner (laughs) 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 um, so we just got uh, a puppy uh, a little sausage dog and uh, it's quite a weird thing that's happened where we've slightly well we started calling each other mummy and daddy, which was really weird. Mm -hmm. You know, like you go to daddy, daddy's got your treats or whatever. And, um, and then Bernie gets that all the time. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> but I think I'd much rather be called a daddy than a mummy. <laughs> I always say that I'm a mummy because I have a, like a, a whole collection of young queers that I try and look after in the best way possible. Oh, that's true, Tom, and you're a really good mummy. I feel like you drinking your wine in that jumper just... You just let the, the mama busy mum. I wish I'd had in the eighties. <laughs> yeah, busy mum. <laughs> but Joe, um, it's, it's interesting yeah, so you you saying about. Uh, I I think in terms of your own identity, I think you we share a lot. You share a lot of things with the LGBTQ plus community because you've experienced it as well. You know, you're living on the fringes mm. of society and outside the norm. So. I think you're a very welcome addition to the pantheon of the throne room. Well, it's it's an honour. It's an absolute <laughs> honour. I mean, yeah, so I was basically, we got into a conversation about pup play and I realised that John <laughs> had no concept of what that was. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, oh my did you show God, him some videos <laughs> did you show him some videos no, I, was like, doing, I was like we're kind of doing it now like look i'm being a pop with pop <laughs> tell him to just listen <laughs> to the podcast to list, <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Um, on one final note before we do Queens of Agony which you've so kindly said mm. you will join in with uh, one of the shows which I've seen a few of your shows and one of your shows was We Are Fucked um, I'm wondering is that a premonition of Covid <laughs> <laughs> well as we were saying things rumble under the surface right? don't they? they certainly do I know, yeah. Well, that actually, that was a sort of response to the last kind of huge world-ending crisis that I personally experienced. So it's kind of weird that it premiered and had its life curtailed by another yeah. kind of um, fuckedness. Totally. Um, yeah, I think that show had more joy in it than COVID has had so far. Yeah. So even my We Are Fucked wasn't quite as fucked we, as we I actually say- are. Yeah. We will fucked will eat itself. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, shall we do some Queens of Agony? Yes, please. Okay, I'm going to do a big gong. I don't think Joe can hear that up her end. Joe, jo but she'll hear it on the when it comes out, we, right? We work yeah. in theatre, Tom. We can suspend our disbelief. Yeah, right. So, dear old Queens. Ever had a hard time sexualizing your partner? During my last relationship, one of the problems that I had with my ex is that it was hard to sexualize him after a while. I'm sure the root of this is an intimacy issue. I'm currently in therapy and working through it, so this pattern won't continue. Have you ever experienced this? Yes. <laughs> No comment. <laughs> uh, obviously, Joe, you don't have to talk about your current partner. You can talk about past partners. Um, I think it, uh, it doesn't. It's one of the things which actually happens in a relationship, doesn't it? I mean, it rarely doesn't happen if it's a long-term relationship. But it's weird that it doesn't happen for me, anyway. Just speaking personally, it doesn't happen when you have a long, sustained affair with someone. Like, you can have an affair with someone for 15 years, 20 years, and you wouldn't desexualize them. But I wonder if it's, um, I think that's exactly it. When you, it's a, it's a hard thing to admit that for me, I think my libido is linked to risk, essentially. So mm. if I don't think that this is stable or it's precarious or, do you like me? Do you not like me? Is this affair going to end? There's a lot of tension in that. Whereas, you know, when you've got the dog and the mortgage and the whatever. Mm. That's spot on, I think, what you just said. And I, I think it's all down to that, really. So there's no real advice as such, is there? Uh, well, I just think there's... Don't get a dog and a mortgage. I'm not, en I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> Well, I'm not entirely sure that it's an intimacy issue because that's what they said. I just think it's a relationship issue. I think it's just, it, it's something that you need to work on. You know, it's it's like if 
I think we can all get a bit staid and bored in a relationship and we all get a bit complacent. And sometimes if you're going to have a long-term relationship, you need to find ways of making it fresh mm, and, mm. and keeping that spice alive. And um, do you ever listen to Esther Perel? No. She has a, she's yes. a French psychotherapist. I love and she, her. She's amazing. And she has... Uh, I can't, I can't do an imitation of her, but she's just, she's like Zsa Zsa Gabor or something, the way she speaks. She does a, a relationship uh, counselling where she gets a couple to agree to be audio recorded while they have relationship therapy. <laughs> while they have sex. <laughs> well, well, no, because quite often it's that they're not having sex. Uh, of you course, know. yeah. And she wrote a book called Mating in Captivity, which kind of talks about this, you know, it's kind of what happens to animals in a zoo. They aren't wild anymore and they kind of become lethargic. And she talks about mystery. And in a way, it's a kind of untrendy, unfashionable, old school French attitude of keeping things a bit mysterious. And, you know, the, the caller talks about intimacy. And I wonder if it's too much intimacy. You know, you know too much about that person. Yes. Yeah, perhaps you're right. Separate bedrooms. Separate bedrooms. Yeah. <laughs> alone time. <laughs> Mysterious alone <Okay>. time. <laughs> or um this is divulging a bit too much, but in a previous relationship I went to relationship counselling and it wasn't about a sexual kind of disconnection, but the therapist told me about a couple that she was she had treated that couldn't communicate about which when one of them wanted to have sex, they found it kind of awkward. And so they used to have an ornament on the mantelpiece. And when e either one of them wanted to have sex, they would turn the ornament around. Oh, wow. That's what I've done with Bernie, but he hasn't got the message yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's so too I don't know, maybe some kind of signal. There's too many <laughs> ornaments. I don't know which one it is. Yeah, it's quite complicated in my blood. <laughs> I mean, you know, very complicated code. I can't. My parents would never have that. I mean, it was like an episode of Hoarders Buried Alive. It was like it was wall to wall ornaments. Which one was turned round? Who? No one would guess. But it I, was an orgy. I, it was an orgy of ornaments, <laughs> ornaments and plates on the wall. Anyway, I do. I quite like the ornament turning. Okay, let's move on, dear old queens. How confident are you in the skin you're in? I see a lot of guys on different feeds and apps who really have worked out and have bodies they are proud of and good on them for being proud after putting all the effort and getting great results. However, I feel a lot of guys with average builds could easily feel sidelined or maybe lack confidence because of this. So I was wondering, how do average bod guys feel about ourselves? Do we generally feel confident in who we are do we envy those who are fitter or maybe a mix of both, depending on the day or time of year or other external factors? What do the old queens think? Well, th this is a body issue thing, isn't it? It's about... The, the thing is, is that everybody has different bodies and you can you can do loads of stuff to change it if that's what you want to do. But there's, there's a lot of about loving yourself in a way. And a lot of your work, Joe, is about that, isn't it? It's... But it, you've been perceived as someone who is different in society. So mm. how do you deal with that? I, yeah, I, I, I feel for that person because I don't know how you learn how to become more comfortable with who you are, but it is a process. I think, I think a lot of it is just caring a lot less about that exterior lens and, you know, of course, I definitely have days where I feel really, you know, lockdown, I've put on quite a lot of weight. I kind of don't care. But when I put on my party dress, I sort of care a bit. And I, I don't quite want to admit it. But then I don't think that's ever felt very linked to how attractive I am or have felt or how sexual I am or have felt. In fact, often I feel like if there's real attraction and sort of sexual chemistry, you're not thinking about that stuff. Yeah, I don't mean to sound patronising. I think it's the kind of thing that hopefully you grow out of because you realise that it's much more varied what you're attracted to and 
what what is attractive about you yeah. i don't know what do you think i think we're bombarded with these images of perfect bodies the truth of the matter is 90 percent of the population don't have that <laughs> And uh, actually, people are attracted to you as you are and being your authentic self in many respects. Uh, And I think about all the people that I've had relationships with and who I've dated, and it's I don't have a particular type that I go for. It's a certain je ne sais quoi about a Mm. a person which I'm attracted to. I don't know. What do you think, Tommy? Well, I have this weird thing with my body, and it might be particular to my body. Like, because I like to be, I like to stay quite lean with a flat stomach, and that's my ideal situation. But when I have reached that, like, and it's probably not other people's ideas of what a, a good body or an attractive body is, but it's mine. But my face looks not so good you know because I carry I I, I look better with a bit more flesh on my face and I look haggard and tired when I've been to the gym a lot but I'm happy with my body so I've just got this sort of constant dilemma between whether I choose my face or my body (laughs) which is I think it's something to do with being over 40 (laughs) well they used to um, I feel like I've heard that applied to women quite a lot or Mm. you know a slightly retro attitude which is you choose your face or your ass you yeah. know that actually your face looks a bit better with a bit of co- you know collagen with a bit of fat in it and those kind of pilates toned women in their 50s in hollywood look a bit or is they're depicted as looking a bit severe yeah but, i mean i think i have that i i have that affinity with those women really yeah yeah and I, and i think the kind of gay world is similar to the female world in a way because it's all about the body beautiful and looking being fit and stuff like that and i i personally think it's it's up to you to do whatever you want which makes you feel great but also remember you're a beautiful human being you're alive that's that's the thing i mean i do a lot of posts on instagram you do <laughs> which keeps us all occupied i thought you were gonna say i mean i do a lot of yoga no I, it looks like an episode of mr bean when i try and do yoga because everything <laughs> goes all over the place so <laughs> do you think so what do you think um i feel like there, there has been a huge shift in kind of masculine gay culture in the last i don't know 10 15 years towards a a super masculine muscular body maybe that's rose tinted maybe that was always there and i wasn't so aware of it but like i remember fancying vince in queer as folk that's the one i fancied not not Stuart or the young it felt like there were maybe some more body options that you could find attractive and now all the gyms are closed is there is it finally time for a new archetype on the front of um attitude or whatever that isn't this kind of super buff muscular body it's a bit normal yeah <laughs> we just... it's a bit locked down <laughs> but isn't that what dad bod's about it, yeah exactly uh... which is one of the reasons why i do post because i've always had body issues personally and uh, a lot of the, the things where I post pictures of my body is not about vanity. It's about this is what I am. It's, you know, this is what I look like. And if you like that, great. But I'm not hiding it. And I think before in my life, I was hiding my body a lot. I mean, I as a teenager, I used to go to the beach and keep all of my clothes on because I'd hate mm-hmm. people seeing my body. Whereas now I feel like I can liberate myself through showing my body that's why I always heart the picture when you take your top off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tommy. It's noted. <laughs> and I'm definitely going to subscribe. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> anyway, I think, yeah, body image is a, a real issue for everyone, I think. And it's it's finding your own place and your own love for yourself uh, without wanting to sound trite about it. But you need to but find that, the happy medium that- of that alter it bernie as a as a tactic that that kind of um public posting of your body does it do something to the way you think about your body yeah it makes me accept it more Mm. because people do seem to like it so it's just like that therefore i accept what i am a bit more than i did before Mm. Uh, Mm. but i still have issues obviously because we uh, you know they they don't go away overnight they multiply (laughs) (laughs) yes (laughs) 
Anyway, let's move on to the next question. Dear old queens, have you ever been friends with benefits with an extremely unattractive guy because the sex was good? Just what the title says, have you ever had regular hookup with a guy who you find extremely unattractive, but the sex was so good you decided to continue? How much does attraction influence pleasure? Well, it's all, it's all on a theme, isn't it? this these questions this week i go back to what i just said i think it's not a it's not necessary it's about a je ne sais quoi why why is the sex with that person good it's not because they're unattractive it's because you are actually attracted to them on some level that you probably didn't think of before am i right or what i think you was right bernie <laughs> correct answer <laughs> <laughs> um, i think you're right too, I, yeah, I, yeah like who what are we saying is attractive? Like, I don't understand. To me, that sounds like that person has some kind of weird, or not weird, but like artificial checklist of what is attractive, or as if they're looking at this person through somebody else's eyes. Because if the sex is good, then they're turned on. Mm. So what's turning them on? And yeah. and that could be unattractiveness. Maybe that's what really revs them up and gets them going. But probably more likely is that they are attracted to this person but that's somehow confronting to what they had previously felt was acceptable or attractive or yeah i don't know if that they're so close together really sort of sexual attraction and a it's kind like of standards yeah yeah or aesthetic it's mm. it's kind of what you deem as the aesthetic that you like but then actually you're getting sexual fulfillment against that so maybe you need to rethink what you what aesthetic you actually like yeah or or maybe just not give yourself that much of a hard time like it's not like you have to sign a contract and say you definitely fancied this person like what what um what difference does it make if you're doing what you're into yeah totally the other person's into it i don't i don't know what the problem is (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think it's a problem i just think they're just stating a fact <laughs> i think that i think there wasn't a problem within that question it was just asking whether we experienced that as well. yeah. yeah have you experienced it probably how about you jay yeah i mean i i feel like there's definitely people that i've been attracted to and or in relationship with or sexual relationship with that other people don't think are attractive or there's some kind of noting that i've got a kind of peculiar taste but i maybe i've never questioned it that much i feel like well i don't think it's that weird to fancy that person because i do yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah totally why would you (laughs) yeah (laughs) okay i've got two we've got this is our final question but i've got two joe have you seen call me by your name i have yes yeah. Have you seen Call Me By Your Name? Which one is it again? Call Me By Your Name. The, uh, oh, with the, the sort of slightly paedophilic. <laughs> Would you say that? Verging <laughs> um, I mean, on. You, you, a guy and a younger yeah. guy. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you could say yeah. that. Okay, so, dear old queens, when I watched Call Me By Your Name, I felt like the younger actor was more committed in playing the gay love scenes than the older actor. It was weird because Timothy Chalamet was not holding back. He was shoving his tongue down Army Hammer's throat whenever he had the chance, while Hammer seemed uncomfortable. If Hammer's character is more experienced, shouldn't he be the one more for it? I don't know if it was written that way or an acting decision mixed with gay panic. At least in Brokeback Mountain, the the actors being uncomfortable (laughs) made sense for the plot. What do you guys think? I love that question. Um, I feel like that one's for Mark Kermode or something. <laughs> but let's give it a go. Tommy, can you fill my glass up with wine? I need some wine before I answer this question. <laughs> I want to ask that person how many times have they watched that film because that seems like quite detailed analysis. Oh, it feels I don't like yeah. that, those details, but. Actually, I'm going to bring it back to Split Bridges again. Because in the late 80s, Lois Weaver was in a film called um, She Must Be Seeing Things. It's a very low-budget film that was filmed in New York. It presented Lois Weaver as a 
bisexual woman who had an affair with a man and was also in a, a steady relationship with a woman. And Lois Weaver is probably the most strongest lesbian person that we know. And this other actor that played the other woman was a straight woman. And loads of people wrote in and said, how dare a straight woman play a bisexual woman? And how dare a lesbian woman? Like, it was really complicated. I'm not explaining it very well. But it was all in the eye of the audience. Like, it was their perception of what these characters were. Yeah. And you can't really do anything about that, really, because you're just the performer or the actor. It's really interesting because I was a, uh, I got into a bit of a um, online rant about straight actors playing gay roles, and I was really playing devil's advocate because I was just like, well, as an actor, I've played straight roles, so I don't necessarily have an issue with a straight actor playing a gay role as long as it's a positive thing. I think a lot more LGBTQI people should be given those roles because they're not represented hugely but i don't necessarily have an issue with it i mean the issue is with the system rather than the yeah rather rather than than the actor playing the role it's just like as an actor you are playing somebody somebody else which isn't you Mm. so it doesn't necessarily have to have the same sexuality as you I think I agree, although I think it is complicated. I've been following a kind of Twitter spat about um, Sia and the video that or film that she made that has an autistic character played by a non-disabled actor. And I think I agree with what you were saying there, Bernie, but I think when I think about non-disabled actors playing disabled actors, I find that really really icky yeah not only for the kind of cripping up which is we can all imagine we can all remember oscar winning performances of that yeah Mm. um and i think i guess the difference is that i don't often see disabled actors getting to play a range of characters so they're either not given the job or they're given the kind of lonely death person or the sad you know whatever um i think that changes some you know it's starting to change i think there's a death character on eastenders that her at least some of her storylines aren't about her being deaf um but i know that one of the responses so is it sia am i saying her name yes correctly? it is sia. Yeah. yeah she didn't take the criticism all too well and uh gave quite a number of quite wild um, reasons. And one of the reasons was the uh, production schedule was quite demanding and quite tight, so we couldn't possibly work with a disabled actor. Wow. Yeah, which, I mean, I don't think she's unusual in naming that bias, but it does imply that there's a kind of worry about working with disabled actors that is going to be somehow hard work or that they're not going to be able to do it well or... I know this is uh, we've we've veered off from the beautiful Timothy Chalamet, but <laughs> we'll go back to that. Don't worry. <laughs> we'll go back. Let's make time for that. Um, but yeah, I I don't know. I I, I feel uh, complicated because on the one hand, I think that art is one of the last places that we can experiment with identity and reality and fiction. But I also feel like. It's like a fundamental problem that we need to address before we can start playing. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And doesn't it? Doesn't that kind of uh, that whole rebuttal is just like undermining the piece of art in general, isn't it? Because it's just like, w- what are you trying to portray with this piece of art? And then uh, the rebuttal of that, the justification of having someone who's not disabled playing that role, just kind of turns yeah. it on its head. And I think she did, one of her other responses was the kind of like, but I've got lots of friends who are gay response, which was, but I've got a friend who's autistic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, when I, whenever I had to put, so I've, I've done loads of highbrow stuff. I played a character in Doctors uh, oh, yeah. called, called Valentine Alexander, who was um, a womanising barrister who had three common-law wives that he got pregnant all on the same day. Apparently, this was a true story. 
and uh, who all lived next to each other. But the character was also having an affair with his legal secretary. I mean, that's just like the antithesis of what I am. <laughs> <laughs> as a person <laughs> I mean that's you so have quite a low sperm count is that what you're trying to well tell us? I mean that's so heterosexual it's unbelievable <laughs> <laughs> yeah but I, I suppose that's a kind of question about punching up or punching down isn't it well yeah no maybe I regret saying that because I but I do know lots of straight people but... in my defense <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I have read a few books by straight people, so I think I know how they think. My parents were straight, in my defence. Well, loosely. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, going back to the, the film... Call me by your I name, like, yes. Um, yes, yes. Um, I thought that in that film... I mean, let's think about how we approach the vigour of sex or kissing when we first became accustomed because i was into it you know yeah totally in a way that probably i've never been since you know in a and i feel like that younger character is just so overwhelmed by this physical sexual connection and i thought that the character of the older guy was supposed to be much more conflicted about that because he has the burden of of kind of power and responsibility as the older guy and, and he, also i think he goes off and gets married doesn't he he goes off gets married he also has a girlfriend in the village so he's playing it straight even though he's gay so i think that's all i think you're right i think it's all part of his character but saying that if i had to kiss army hammer in a scene i'd do it with as much vigor i think <laughs> I, if I had Timothy Chalamet in a scene, I would also give it some welly. Well, of course. <laughs> well, either of them. <laughs> what about you, Tom? Uh, well, I just want to say, like, isn't it amazing that someone's bothered to write to a problem page with this issue? <laughs> like... Right. Yeah, they mean... can't sleep at night. They're constantly thinking about it. I mean, like, I, d I just love that that's all that they've got to worry about. I mean, there are worse things to worry about. I'm, I'm glad. I mean, I just want this distraction during COVID times. <laughs> yeah. Let's just talk about this for some more. <laughs> Me too. I applaud this question. <laughs> oh, Joe, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been wonderful to have you, and we look forward to a queermas quandary with you hopefully sometime soon it is my ultimate honor i feel like i can die happy now thank you old queen <laughs> you've been a fabulous guest you've been brilliant <laughs> you've been amazing and uh, poignant and insightful and uh great. slightly highbrow very highbrow for us which is great i'm hopefully our highbrow audience will increase <laughs> we can lower the tone later <laughs> <laughs> well we always know how to do that <laughs> anyway joe um please say goodbye to our lovely audience bye lovely audience lots of love <laughs> and tommy say goodbye stay horny stay safe <laughs> safe <laughs> stay horny stay Safe. Safe. Great. Yeah, I didn't yeah. stumble on the horny. <laughs> <laughs> you never stumble on the horny. We will see you next time on What That Old Queen. You have been listening to What That Old Queen. Written and presented by Tom Marshman and Bernie Hodges. The show was produced by Bernie Hodges for Hodge Podcasting in the year 2020. If you have a Queens of Agony question, or you'd like to be a guest, or if you'd like to sponsor one of our shows, you can email hello at thatoldqueen.com or find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. <laughs> <laughs>